I recognize that among the aristocracy in England and things like that, if you're a Marquis or an Earl or something of that nature, that you have the right to be called my Lord. And it does find its roots in the idea of what the Bible has to say and means about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. I find David wrote in Psalm 110 and verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord. And Mary said in John 20 and verse 13, They have taken away my Lord. In John 20 and verse 28, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And in Philippians 3, 8, Paul wrote, Christ Jesus, my Lord. So it's important that every Christian, and I always say this, but I want to emphasize it, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, not as people commonly use it, that every Christian thinks of Jesus as my Lord. I want us to appreciate what it means to have Jesus as my Lord. So this sermon is to better help us understand what it is and what it means for each one of us as Christians, members of the Lord's spiritual body, to be able to say that Jesus is my Lord. And therefore, let's for a little while focus our thoughts on each word begin, beginning with the word Lord. The word for Lord is usually kurios, and it's related to the word kuros, meaning power. Of course, I refer to the Koine Greek language of the first century in which the New Testament was written. It's variously translated as master or owner, and it is describing one having power or authority. And certainly Jesus, according to Matthew 28 and verse 18, had such power and authority. Another word of which we're probably not as familiar is the word despotes, from which we get the word despot. Today, it's often used in a bad sense. In fact, I doubt you've heard it used in a good sense. It's a person exercising power abusively, oppressively, or tyrannously, a tyrant. Its primary definition is a ruler with absolute power or authority. Now, this word is used in reference to God in several passages, one of them being Luke 2 and verse 29, another Acts 4, 24, and in the book of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10. It is also used in referring to Jesus Christ in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 21, where it's rendered master, and in 2 Peter 2, 1, where it is translated Lord. It is thought to be somewhat stronger than curios, for it speaks of having this absolute power and authority. Now, who has the power or who has the authority to claim to be my master, my owner? And you know how we as Christians, remember how to find Christian, members of the Lord's church, as that word is defined and used in the New Testament, well, it should be that the Christian should answer Jesus, my Lord. Jesus is to be my Lord as he himself taught his disciples in John 13, 13. That is, you are under my direction. The apostle Peter also proclaimed Jesus as Lord in the first recorded sermon. It happens to be Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, the day the church started. In Acts 2 and verse 36. Then too we find him using it at the household of Cornelius. The first uncircumcised Gentile converts. In Acts 10 36. The apostle Paul proclaimed Jesus as Lord. By virtue of his death and resurrection. As he wrote to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 9. Then to Christians Jesus is the only Lord, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and Ephesians 4, 5. 
In other words, he's the only one that is my Lord. He is the only one that is my master. Jesus then, who is our kurios, our despotes, our Lord, our master, holds complete sway over us. It's the attitude in us that says, not my will, but thine be done. Not the way I want it, not the way anybody else wants it, but let it be as the Lord has described and set out and taught us in His Word. Now let me pause here and point out, that's the reason that it is the Word that can unify us the way God demands that we be at one with one another. Because He is the head, that means He is the guiding force of the body of which we are members in particular. This makes us all one with one another in our goals, our purposes, our desires, because the Word of God doesn't change. And this rules out any other lords. Now, what other lords could there be? Well, what about ourselves? You notice in Galatians 2.20 that Paul talked about my own will. I fear greatly that's what governs most people, is my own will or their own will. And I've said many times that a lot of the, even secular psychologists and people like that, have said that a whole lot of folks' problems emotionally and uh, mentally is because they're trying to always get the whole world to revolve around them. Well, you can't have anything but conflicts. Is that's what it's going to be. And that won't work. No one... No one should be having himself as his Lord. We must deny self according to Jesus. We must follow Jesus as Lord, Luke 9, 23 and 24. Well, there's one thing. Self cannot be my Lord. Another is my own flesh, this body that God put us in that's fitted for this world that will go back to the dust from which it came. It has appetite. Now, governed by the will of Christ to set out the Word of God, those appetites have, as I said, governed. They have a governor like an engine on it. You, you can't go but so fast. You see, we're made in such a way as seeking to gratify our appetites of the flesh to the nth degree, we just burn ourselves out. And you know, an engine can even run fast enough to destroy itself. But you see, we're free moral agents, so we must be willing to place that governor our own fleshly engine, if you please, our own bodies, and govern these desires with the will of Christ. In Galatians 5, 24, he talks about the works of the flesh. And he talks about his own or our own fleshly desires. They must be brought under the control of Christ. So the Bible, or the New Testament in particular, when it talks about controlling our passions and our appetites it talks about we must crucify the flesh that's what he means if you've ever wondered what that meant we must crucify the flesh and the lust thereof well what does that mean well how do you crucify the flesh well it's focusing in on the fact that christ died by crucifixion he could have delivered himself folks he made that clear no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I give it. So, we must understand then that we crucify the flesh when we deny ourselves. That is, deny the gratification of the appetites of the fleshly body, contrary to the governor of God's word that's set over us. Thus, it takes our will to yield to God's will. And Jesus then is our perfect example. Paul talks about what we must do along that line in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So we've seen my own self shouldn't be my Lord. My fleshly self shouldn't be my Lord. And the world all about us shouldn't be my Lord or your Lord. So anything outside myself which would lead me away from the Lord, Galatians 6 and verse 14. Now you realize that doesn't just cover sinful things. Things that are automatically a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. It can be anything of this present world that I devote myself first, foremost, and always to letting the Lord's kingdom take second, third, or fourth place. 
What we need to know is that God doesn't take second place to anybody. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. So this would include such things as, believe it or not, our secular work. And another, our families. Luke 14, 15 through 24. The Lord talked further about it later in the chapter, verses 25 through 27. And you say, but he talks about how we should work. The man won't work, well, shouldn't he? The man won't provide for his own, he's worse than an infidel. All that. Well, yes, that's true. God put us here to fleshly body, fleshly appetites. He knows what it takes for us to live on this earth. But you see, it means that we're letting the word of God direct us as to how much we time we give to those things. Is there not a principle of first things first? Just think for a moment. Would you resolve in your mind right now there is no such principle as first things first? Some things ought to come before other things. Well, if the Lord is my Lord, then His authority and His Word governs what I plan to do with what I am and what I do with what I am. And if Christ is first in my life, then His will is first in my life. And therefore, I'll be what I ought to be to self, to my flesh, to the world around me. And I'll know how to choose a job like I ought to. I'll know how I ought to be toward my family. But without the Word of God, we don't know how He wants us to be toward any of these things. We cannot let the philosophy and traditions of men be our Lord's. Colossians 2, 6 through 10. Paul deals with that directly there. What is it simply saying? Well, one thing it does is further point out why the prophet Hosea said of the people of his day, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, some people can spend their time study, 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 learning, learning, learning. And Paul said of folks like that sometimes, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are some very intellectual people, high IQ with much academic learning, and they're doing maybe great things for this present world. But they couldn't tell you the first step in God's plan of salvation. And many times it's because they're not even interested. So it's how we use what God has given us, what we are. Our fleshly bodies. Are they tools? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says they ought to be. Said so our bodies ought to be living sacrifices used daily. And it begins by us renewing our minds. What does it mean to renew our minds? Well, it means that we're letting the truth of God cause us to focus. And when that happens, there'll be some things we won't focus on, other things we will zero in that we would not otherwise. Things will become important that at one time were not important. I promise you, if you take a person out here in the world that has really no religious background and is dedicated to the affairs of this present world, and you put him into a group of people who are dedicated to know the Bible, to live according to the Bible, to be interested in the kingdom, the spreading of the gospel, and submitting to Christ, unless they're willing to learn, they're going to be some of the most miserable people on earth. That's the reason that this life is perfect for what God intended. It's a place to get ready for eternity in heaven with God. That's what he meant for us to do. If you were to take a person right now who's not interested in godly things, none whatsoever, and God just take him and stick him right in the middle of heaven, it'd be a horrible place for him. You don't think that way, do you? Because you think, well, I'd just like to be, why, why must I undergo all these trials and tribulations? And just put me in heaven right now. Well, I think God knew what he was doing. I think he knew how to prepare a soul for heaven. So we have a chance here to show him, I'll choose the Lord in his way over any of these other things. And in so doing, though whether I understand it or not makes no difference, I mold and make my character after his will. So when you sing that song the next time, uh, Thou art the potter, I am the clay, Mold me and make me after thy will. Now you know what you're actually saying. You never, may have never thought about that before, but you're saying, God, make me so I'll enjoy heaven. 
An unregenerated person, a person not caring for those things, would not enjoy heaven. So I want to enjoy heaven. That means I do things that are right because I know they're right, even when they're distasteful. You do? Yeah, I've got a good example of that. It's called Jesus being nailed to the cross. That was not something that felt good to him. Seems kind of silly to make a statement like that. But it was necessary to go through that I could call him my Lord and walk in his steps and shape my character in the likeness of Christ. We should not be letting our brethren be our lords. I think I've known a number of preachers who the brethren was their lords. And they were afraid to preach some things that ought to be preached plainly and frankly and to the point and candidly and even bluntly because the people need to hear it. They were in sin. But when that preacher knows where his paycheck comes from, Sometimes it's easy to overlook all those things. I learned this a long time ago about lectureships. There were some preachers that would go, you know, 400 miles over here, and boy, they would really drop a bomb on everybody. They come back home <laughs> where their bread's buttered, and they don't sound too much that way. But it shouldn't be that way. If we love one another, we want to tell each other the way to heaven. Have you ever told your child or had your parents tell you, Watch that limb or watch out going that way. There's a hole down there. And have you ever seen children that didn't listen and sometimes they ran into something they didn't want to and then they come squalling back to daddy. Well, you know the comment? Why didn't you listen to me? I wonder how many times in all sorts of languages throughout this world that's been said in the last 30 minutes to some child. Some of us just seem to fear our own brethren more than they fear the Lord. And I've never understood that. Never. People who are members of the church and all that that means, who are Christians, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, show forth that they are different from the ways of the world in their language and in their conduct before the world and before their brethren. In 1957, Daddy went away from home for a while to work for a period of months. And what was then in the old International Paper Company's organization of that day and time, the Southern Craft Division headquarters in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, we went down to see him, and we went with a couple of ladies whose husbands were down there. Now, this was when I was about 10 years old. If you don't think things hit children, they stick with them. But one of these ladies was a member of the church. And we went down there, and I can remember meeting the man then. Well, years later, in my junior year of college, I worked at the paper mill for the summer because that was one of the privileges that those employees had to allow their kids and summer work to work there. And I was going up stairs one day in one building there, and this same man I'd met who was a member of the church. And I'd seen him wait on the Lord's table, and he was coming down as I was going up, and he was coloring the air blue with his language. And I remember from 10 years old that he was a member of the church. And there I was many years later, about 20 years old then. And that just, you know, that, that's not supposed to happen. Do you think possibly somebody somewhere, you know, little pictures have big ears, do you think somebody remembers that about other members of the church who say they're Christians, who can sit down in an assembly like this and say, oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise, and then just use His name in vain the next day with the crowd or laugh at the dirty jokes or whatever it may be. Yes, members of the church do that. And if they don't repent, they will be lost. What about attending services? Only to please the brethren. 
Well, they've been after me so much, I guess I better go. Get them off my back. Can you really say Christ is my Lord and all that that means? Your master? Well, while we may submit to those in authority, husbands, elders, government, whoever it is, teachers, it is because we've made Jesus our one Lord and master above all others, and thus his will we strive to do no matter where it puts us with the brethren or anybody else. The quicker a person makes up his mind to follow the Lord at all costs, then he'll be far better off in everything else in life. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be happy with you. In fact, you may make a bunch of folks unhappy with you that never would be unhappy with you if you just go with the flow. But you'll always know this when you're acting in concert with the will of Christ as revealed in the Word of God. My Lord will be very happy with me. So many Christians live as though their self, their flesh, the world, or their brethren, or their master, or their Lord, was their owner. So it may help to avoid this divided loyalty. And that's what it is, a divided loyalty. If we truly make Jesus my Lord. Thinking of Jesus as my Lord. The Lord has easily professed by those who so easily profess by those who simply accept Jesus intellectually. It's not that simple, is it? An atheist could read the Bible and say, well, I read that and I see it sets forth that Jesus as my Lord. It would mean anything to him. Our Lord is often professed by those um, whose acceptance of Christ is influenced primarily by one's environment. What do I mean by that? By their parents, by their spouses, by their brethren. Over all the years I've preached the gospel, I've watched children grow up seemingly from very good families. And by good, I mean those who love the Lord by all outward appearances and then their involvement in the church and so forth. And yet in reality, they were just coasting along doing what was just done in their home. There was no personal, individual faith in God being formed. And when they got out of those environments, they had nothing to hold to. Jesus wasn't really to them saying it as they ought to say it, my Lord. They'd never developed a personal faith in Christ built upon their own personal Bible study and conviction. And thus, when the winds of this present world blew, they blew right along with it. Thinking of our Lord Jesus as my Lord, making it a, a more personal commitment to his authority. That's what it comes down to in power. We can go through keeping the rules, if you want to call them that, of the New Testament. We can be here for every assembly on the first day of the week. We can partake of each part, have a part in each act of worship. We can do all those things, but I will tell you now, if you do not have personal faith in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come to the Father but by Him, that He is your Lord to render obedience to because of what He did for you and no one else can do it, and there's no salvation found in any other name. There's none other name given among heaven whereby we must be saved. Then you're not going to be as you ought to be because your faith is not in Christ based solely upon His gospel and His word. Making it more likely that is individuals that as individuals we will heed what he says if we will have this personal faith coming from our own study and our own personal convictions based upon what we learned Jesus will not be our true master and Lord unless we view him as my Lord let's look at the state of mind or attitude or mindset of Jesus as my Lord it involves a disdain for things of this present world. Philippians 3, 7 through 8. Uh, this is almost just a study of the book of Philippians. 
The more you live in harmony with the truth of Christ as manifested in his word, the more the things of this life just don't seem to be important at all, except as you can use them to spread and defend the gospel and to reach souls. They just pale and insignificant as life goes on because they're transient. They're passing. Popularity, worldly prestige, even family. Those things do not take first place in our lives. It is God and His will that takes first place in our lives. Willing to suffer loss of these things is necessary if Christ is going to be my Lord. Because we, we would consider such things, as Paul says, as but dung or rubbish in contrast to doing the Lord's will. They mount to nothing with us if they come between us and obeying God. So we need to have a consuming desire to know Christ. And Paul makes that clear, if you want to note this, in Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 11. To know him as close as it's possible to know him through his last will and testament. To know his righteousness, to know his power, to know even his sufferings, Paul says. It involves constantly pressing on toward perfection, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. One cannot be complacent in one's service to Christ. One is never satisfied with one's level of, of growth, spiritual growth. And we must be willing to leave the past behind. I think I've seen a number of people over the years who always have in tow what took place in the past. And they're not going to let it loose. They're not going to cut themselves from it. And so they drag it all through life. And it causes problems all the way through their lives. It's great to have accomplished good things as the Bible defines those things in our past. It's good to have forsaken those things evil as they're defined in the Bible. But we don't need to glory on past accomplishments. That's good. Build on it. But what about today? And if tomorrow comes, what about then? On the other hand, there's no use wallowing in past failures. Paul talks about that when he says forgetting those things that are behind but he also had in mind the accomplishments for good that we leave behind because they're behind. That's over and done with. You can't go back and change it, so you move forward, pressing toward the goal. And Paul's attitude demonstrates the attitude of one who has truly made Jesus my Lord. The attitude of maturity, spiritually speaking, as a disciple of Jesus. Again, I urge you at this time, if you want to do it tonight, I would say do it. Read Philippians, and I think now Philippians 3 and verse 15. So the question I'm asking is when you think of the Lord, is that somebody out there that's somebody's Lord? Our Lord, members of the church collectively, he's our Lord. Well, he is both of those. But what about my Lord? You know, years ago when the aristocracy owned virtually all the land, let's say of Great Britain, in England in particular, or Scotland, or Wales, anywhere a person lived or a building they owned, they usually rented it from the lord of the manor. And they would tell me when they go over there, and I have read about it too, this was the forelock. Now, those of you who have lost your forelock, you can't do this. But when you met going down the street, the Lord of the manor, then you stepped aside and you did this. Well, we've got Americans. We fought a battle. Quit having to do that kind of... The problem is we fought a battle and we're so independent, we don't even think about that when it comes to humility before Jesus Christ. We're not in a democracy or even a constitutional republic in the church. We are under an absolute monarchy whose king's word is law and who's bold enough to say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Now when I can read that and say, Jesus is my Lord, then I'll begin to understand the contriteness and humility of the heart that bows to the Prince of Peace and he who has all authority in heaven and earth. Because if I don't bow now, and if I don't live that bowed down obedient life, 
The Bible plainly tells me that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Christ is the Son of God when he comes again. What we're asking now is let him be your Lord, your master, your owner. And in your mind you're saying he's my Lord, my master, and my owner. So what is Jesus to you? Again, don't just say he's the Lord. Don't just say he's our Lord. Say he's my Lord. But you can't unless you believe and obey the gospel. Unless you're living faithfully in the church to his will. Jesus would have us accept him as Lord because he knows there's no other salvation than through him in his gospel. He has all authority and expects us to observe what he commands. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Yet he warned of those who profess his lordship but fail to truly demonstrate it in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Listen. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So are you and I doing the Father's will? Are we demonstrating that Jesus is truly my Lord and Master in all things. If you're not a Christian, we beg of you to consider these things, repenting of your sins, having believed on Him, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, to live your life faithful to Him and the church to which He will add you, the church that He built and purchased with His own precious blood. If as a child of God, He's been the Lord, he's been our Lord, but some way the personal part of it, he's my Lord over my life. His will is going to be done if nobody else's is done. He is my Lord. If that's slipped, then recognize where it slipped in your life. Repent of those sins. Come confessing them and we'll pray with you and for you. And let us all leave here truly and honestly and sincerely able to say, Jesus is my Lord. Lord. So if you need to come, we invite you to come now while we stand and sing.